The master of kung fu and friendship implores you. Go back. Beyond this video is danger. The shadow awaits, and you're not ready yet. Give up your quest. There's nothing for you here. Uh, you're still here? Alright, fine. Whatever. Let's talk about the Guardian Archetype. Y'all are persistent. I'm author DC Ferguson, and this is the World Building Dojo. Before we get started, I want to give you all a quick reminder. Subscribers to my newsletter are getting a copy of Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, for free. This short story is a prequel to the Dragon's Dream Saga, and it's a great chance to get started with the series. I link the newsletter sign up in the comments. Make sure to sign up and get your free copy. So the Guardian Archetype, also sometimes called the Threshold of Guardian, is all that stands between our hero and the Shadow. Their purpose is simple. Keep the hero away from the Shadow. Sometimes, as with Darth Vader and Return of the Jedi, they're more involved and fleshed out than the Shadow, even mistaken as the Shadow themselves. Other times, like with Carl here, uh, they're just the toughest son of a gun on the Shadow's team. In either case, they're present to test the hero. The primary purpose they serve is that the hero, in all their transformational glory, gets to take the gloves off for the first time and show their incredible power. Is it always combat, though? Absolutely not. Guardians can be cunning and require the hero to outsmart them. Sometimes the Guardian isn't a person at all. It can be an inanimate object or even a circumstance. Sometimes we can have an entire team of Guardians, something that's very popular in anime, actually. Or the entire film can be trials of the hero going through one Guardian after another. Wow. With this many ways to break it down, where's the room for the shadow, right? Well, funny you should mention that. Films and books with one or more guardians often spend a great deal of the focus building up those guardians, and painfully little character development is handed off to the shadow. But don't worry, baby birds. I'm here, and I'm going to feed you all the things you need to know on how to prepare for that, even subvert the pitfalls entirely. But first, we're going to convert a 19th century sled into a time machine, and see why our ancestors felt it necessary to put a boulder in our hero's way. Getting to the shadow means we go through the Guardian. As such, we need to clear a path. All obstacles must be removed, so there's no question that our hero has bested the shadow and brings about the new age. But our shaman dancing around the fire here, why did he feel the Guardian was a necessity? Well, keep in mind, our stories passed down are of threats within and threats without. So the Guardian is a boulder in the way of our path. We can go around it, through it, or over top of it. Life is no different. Remember, many of these legends were more than just morality plays. They were vivid, entertaining instruction sets for how to live our lives. The Guardian is not only an evil lieutenant, they're the voice of self-doubt. They are that pessimist in our head telling us, you can't make it, you're not good enough, the shadow will defeat you, turn back. The hero overcoming this archetype can be overcoming a physical obstacle, a circumstance, but they're also overcoming their own doubt. In so doing, their quest is blessed. They have achieved spiritual creaminess between mind, body, and soul, and are fully committed to the great deed of vanquishing the shadow. This reasoning is a bit heady, because there's not only the characters in the story, but also the psychological aspects to overcome. However, when we look at it through this lens, again, the Guardian archetype takes on much greater meaning and power in our stories. We must defeat the Guardian in front of us, because the hero is declaring that they are ready to take the Guardian into themselves as an aspect of their personality. But DC, are we advocating for cannibalism? Well, guy who talks to your monitor, no. And really weird that you asked me that. No, what we're talking about here is that the Guardian is wise, so we defeat them with cunning. This shows we faced the danger, saw it for what it was. We fought fire with fire and won. We can now be considered cunning and wise, and we are ready to face the shadow. By defeating the Guardian, we take a piece of them and what they represented to defeat our hero, to use it against the shadow. Oh boy, I, I can see how this can get confusing. Let's get into an example. Carl is a walking German nightmare lieutenant of Hans Gruber in Die Hard. He is the strongest, the scariest, the most dedicated to carrying out their plans. When John is forced to confront him, Carl takes a beating, but he dishes it out as well. John hits him and beats on him, but he won't die. At the climax of the fight, John kills him with the strength of the chain, hanging poor Carl by his neck. Now John is ready to face Hans in a final showdown. But look at him when he shows up. 
John is beaten, bloodied, strong. He refuses to die despite his injuries. For every guardian that was put in front of him, John is overcome and now brings all of those tools to the final battle. Tools he took from those he bested. You see how that works? The guardian demands not only that we best them, but that we incorporate them into our psyche to further our transformation. If you think of it like uh, Mega Man, we beat the bad guy, we take their weapon, and then we use it to overcome the next guardian. By the time we reach Dr. Wily's robot castle, we have to use every single weapon we've taken from our enemies to best the shadow. Now, speaking of Dr. Wily's castle... When we begin a hero's journey, they are not, I repeat, not on the same playing field as the shadow. We'll talk more about that next week, but the important part to understand is that the hero is rising up. Remember, our story has rising action. Our hero is often an underdog, rising up to face the shadow. They have obstacles they must rise above. The point is, the hero is always climbing a mountain. The reason for this is because our shadow lives in a secret world. What does that mean? Well, this can be metaphorical or literal. If we're saying metaphorical, then the shadow may have a privileged existence, hidden behind a castle, or upper management of government or corporations. The shadow rose up through these ranks at one time too, and now they're at the top of the mountain. Our hero has to get there. That's exactly what the hero's journey is. If we're being literal, then our shadow is in another land, either by air or sea, even space or dimension. As we discussed earlier, the Guardian may also be called the Threshold Guardian, and the reason for that is that they stand in the way of the Threshold to the world of the villain. As such, we'll see them pop up at the Act 1 transition, often the Act 2 transition, and even the final rising action before the climax. Sometimes the entire journey goes through several Guardians. When we look at the Princess Bride, Wesley passes through each one of the three Guardians to reach the secret world of Act 2 the world where he and Buttercup run away together through the swamp. Again, the Guardians have at him when Wesley is captured, and then the Guardians best him by killing him. Ah, but he's only almost dead. So, he defeats the Guardian, death basically, to cross the next threshold, into the secret world of the castle. Here, inside the castle, with no Guardians left, Wesley can have a one-on-one -on -one battle with the Shadow and defeats him in his world. Using what we've learned, each time Wesley battled, he was a better swordsman, a better strategist, more cunning and wise, until the strength of his conviction alone made the shadow cower in fear. The Guardian blocks the door. We want to get off Tatooine to get to the secret world. We have to battle Darth Maul first. We want to save Morpheus trapped in the secret world. We have to battle through the lobby first. It's not just as simple as a scene change we're talking about here. We're leaving the familiar behind. The hero is shedding off the world they know. The secret world is unknown. The rules there are different. The shadow is the strongest in that world. Most importantly, the hero is not a master of this world, so they are always treated as an outsider or a threat. Sometimes, that's not always the case, however. Let's look at Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, for example. This nozzle tries to seduce Charlie with a fortune in exchange for stealing one secret from the factory. But, as we all know, Charlie gives the item back to Willy Wonka even after Wonka kicks him out at the end, thus proving his virtue. This guardian was no enemy at all. He posed as a potential ally, perhaps even a shapeshifter, but the truth is, he was a guardian hired by Willy Wonka himself. Now, is Willy Wonka the shadow in this story? No, of course not. So if Willy Wonka isn't evil, then what does that say about the Guardian he hired? The story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is actually worth looking at because it is constantly subverting tropes of the hero's journey while still going through the motions. Instead of evil guardians at every threshold, we have allies that prove themselves unworthy falling prey to each of their own vices. With each one, we find that Charlie is not subject to this vice or that vice, so he rises above their guilt. He's transforming in spite of them, you see. He's not being dragged into the muck with the rest of them. And in the end, Charlie shows his virtue, the last proof that he has overcome the self to do what he believes is morally right. He overcomes the temptation of the Guardian, but alas, it was just a test. The real shadow in the story is the dark, selfish part of Charlie himself. He defeats his own shadow, not Willy Wonka, 
As colorful and fun a movie as this is on the surface, Tim Burton's dark remake of this film really wasn't that much of a stretch. The story was pretty dark as it was. So, Marty McFly has a problem. He needs to be in the DeLorean by a certain time, driving to hit the cable just as lightning strikes the clock tower, only he's locked in a trunk. Well, that situation is a threshold guardian. Likewise, when he gets out, now he has to play guitar, or his parents won't be together. That's also a guardian. But, DC, if those are guardians, does that mean Biff is the shadow? Well, guy who talks to your monitor, for all the trouble that Biff is in the Back to the Future series, he's never the shadow. In the first film, Marty's enemy is time itself. He has to put every piece into place to restore the past that he damaged and make it back home. Think about it. When his photograph of his siblings is almost completely faded and Marty starts to disappear, time is the one that's erasing him. The Guardian is at the gates always saying, Turn around. Go back. You can't enter the secret world. The Guardian wants our hero to give up the quest, and sometimes it seems like fate itself is out to get them. Batman is in a race to find someone. He comes up to a red light, runs right through it. A truck coming the other way smashes into the Batmobile. Battered and bloody, Batman gets out of the destroyed vehicle and keeps going on foot. Not only was the truck a guardian, but so is the red light. This series of obstacles and mini guardians that keep trying to deter our hero don't have to be a physical person. They can be circumstance. If it's trying to keep our hero from the secret world, it's a guardian. It's important to understand this concept because, you know, it's time I let you ask that question. But, DC, I want my guardian to be a statue. Can I do that? Well, yes, of course you can. Guy who talks to your monitor. This statue has a bowl in its hands. The warning on the statue reads, The way will become clear when you give what you hold most dear. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that the solution to this riddle is blood. This is a guardian. Realizing that solution, our hero is like, I don't want to give this statue all my gravy. The hero has a choice, overcome the guardian and access the secret world, or turn back, run away. Don't hurt yourself for the stupid statue. For our storytelling, this test could be our hero's biggest fear, or proof of their dedication to open the path. Remember, just because you can basically make a guardian out of anything, doesn't mean you should. The guardian still needs to make sense in the context of your story. Like, for example, this statue that wants blood in a bowl doesn't work in a children's book very well. It also doesn't work for the Guardian itself to somehow be out of place. Like, you don't want the statue blocking the path to your girlfriend's apartment. That's just weird. The point is, Guardians have a psychological purpose and a significance to our hero, and it should be reflected in what they demand to be overcome. Then, like Mega Man, we can take their weapons and use it against the Shadow. And as we all know, the Shadow is weak to bubble lead. The Guardian is a locked door to the secret world. Our hero becomes the key by overcoming them and taking the trial into themselves, a final transformation before facing down the Shadow. You can use them liberally or have few at all, but what is most important is that it is psychologically significant to our hero's transformation. We're still working with the Boston-based needs organization to get this beautiful lady a service dog. Her name is Liana, she's 11 and on the spectrum. This wonderful person is my little girl, and if you'd like to help out, there's a link in the comments below. Also, don't forget to sign up for my newsletter, the link is also in the comments, and you're going to get Cora Blake, Arcane Agent, for free. You'll get cool news about what I'm working on in books and here on the channel, and it comes loaded with cool authors and promotions for fantasy and sci-fi. Don't forget to like and subscribe to hear about new videos, and as always, I'm DC Ferguson, now have fun and get crafting.